everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. There's something about hearing a loved one's voice that's comforting. You hear your mom call your name. Nothing scary about that. Except, mom's not home right now. So, who's really calling your name? To hear the voice of a loved one, where their voice shouldn't be, What does it mean? How do you explain that to yourself? Or when you think you feel the spirit of someone kind, so you let them in, so to speak, only to learn you've been tricked and you've let the wrong one in. There's something about wholesomeness growing into darkness that can leave one feeling overcome with fear or unease. Sometimes, all one can do is simply share their experience and try to move on. And hearing those experiences, well, that's why you've all tuned in to The Darkest Hour. So, let's get started, shall we? Has anyone ever witnessed a shadow person and a living person interacting or working together? From 2004 to 2007, my best friend Katie and I worked at a small family-owned seafood restaurant in Winchester Bay, Oregon. In 2006, we were invited by the cook and a small group of regulars to come to a bonfire on the bay to watch the fireworks with them on the 4th of July. Thinking it sounded interesting and having no other plans, we agreed to come. Upon arrival, we find the boys drinking next to a huge fire, situated in a large clearing-type strip of grass. There's a ton of regulations about burning in Oregon, because of the risks of wildfires that can burn out of control very quickly, so this huge grassy area was perfect, especially since they had created a secure fire pit before lighting anything. This grassy stretch was surrounded on three sides with dense thickets of evergreens. There was one wide, clearly defined trail that led through the trees to the water's edge and a gravel parking area behind us. Being 20 years old, we weren't opposed to drinking, but we didn't really know these men that well, so we decided to stay sober and just enjoy the fire and the upcoming show in the sky, just in case they started acting inappropriately. After chatting for a bit, the guys decide they want to partake in an herbal smoking session. Katie and I say, no thanks, and the boys head off into the trees to puff the chiba. Katie and I are standing alone by the fire, just vibing and enjoying the evening. Suddenly, I get this strange sensation, and my eyes keep wandering to a specific area of the tree line. It's a crawling sensation which I'm trying to ignore, but I can't help myself. I just keep glancing over. After a minute or two, an older woman comes walking out of the trees. She was not on or near the trail. This tiny woman had walked through an area of thick undergrowth in the pitch black. She was short and looked frail, although it was hard to tell if she was dressed in layers of raggedy long skirts or dresses and had several shawls or blankets wrapped around her shoulders, like a human rag bag. She was hunched over and walking slowly, as if she were older and her joints were bothering her. She was a little over a hundred yards away, and it was twilight, so I couldn't make out her face or features, just her outfit, which, I'm not going to lie, was pretty creepy. Figuring she was a homeless person who deserved some respect and sympathy, I tried not to stare. However, when I looked over at Katie, she was watching this woman too. The woman had a force or vibe about her that made it hard not to watch her. She gave off the feeling of a wild animal in your house when you know it's probably not too dangerous, but you have to keep your eyes on it just in case it becomes aggressive before you can get it out, if that makes sense. A feeling of unease that I kept trying to shake. 
Katie turns to me and asks if I'm seeing this. I reply yes. She's probably just a homeless person. Poor lady. Katie responds by telling me that the woman is giving her a weird feeling and that it makes her skin crawl to the point that Katie feels she shouldn't look away. This validation of my misgivings is not comforting. Katie and I stand in silence, watching the woman make her slow, tottering way along the tree line to our front left. I am still feeling bad for staring, and I'm going through all the reasons in my head that I'm an idiot for worrying about a decrepit grandmother, even if she does look like a stereotypical witch. Suddenly, the woman comes to a complete stop. Until this moment, she had been looking at the ground. She now stops, raises her head, and looks directly at us. A feeling of dread immediately hits me in the gut. My stomach drops. Her look feels malevolent, even though I still can't make out facial features in the dusk. Then, no shit, this woman raises her left arm and points straight at us, while letting out the most blood-curdling screech I've ever heard in my life. I think my heart stopped beating for a second. Then, and I will have this image in my head until the day I die, Right in front of her pointing finger, a silhouette of a human made of what looked like black mist coalesced, a shadow person, the first one I'd ever seen. I don't know if it just appeared or if it actually came from her body. I barely had time to register what I was seeing before the thing flew towards us. It moved so incredibly fast that it blurred and covered about 300 feet in less than three seconds. This thing passed directly between me and Katie, on my left and her right. It literally blew my hair back over my shoulder on the side that it rushed past. We spent several seconds in complete shock, staring at each other with bloodless, pale faces. Simultaneously, we both turned to look at the woman. She was no longer looking at us or acknowledging us in any way. But she'd picked up her pace and was doing a hobbling sort of run in the direction she'd originally been headed. Eyes on the ground. Katie and I stood in silence, each afraid we might have just gone mad. At first I was afraid to even ask her if she'd seen that thing, but looking at her face, I knew she had seen something. She finally asked if I'd seen what she just did, because she wasn't sure if it was real. We compared notes and realized that we'd both witnessed the same thing. When I started freaking out about the fact that this thing had been real enough to blow my hair back, she admitted that while she did not experience her hair moving, she had seen my hair blow back as she turned her head to watch it move between us. I have no idea who that woman was or what she sent after us. It looked like a shadow person, but who knows what they even are. And never in my life have I ever heard of a shadow person doing a living person's bidding. And I've looked into it after this experience. I've never seen her again, and I surely never want to. This experience has bothered me for years. And so I bring it to the internet to find out if anyone else has ever witnessed a shadow person and a living person working together. Or to at least get some theories as to what the hell happened that night. I think we saw the shadow thing once more a couple of nights later. But it didn't have a human shape that time. So I'm not sure if it was the same entity. But the timing seemed too coincidental. Thanks for reading and commenting. I'm excited and also feeling a little nervous to hear some theories on this experience. Several years ago, 
when my daughter was around four years old, I experienced something that really creeped me out at the time. It still does, to an extent, but now I have the luxury of it feeling a bit further away. It happened in our old house, one that I was never really fond of. We rented it for several years, even a couple of years before our daughter was born, and it never really felt warm. I would decorate, we'd added our own style to the place, but it always just felt like a hotel room that we were staying in temporarily, that we weren't welcome long term. Before the incident with my daughter, which I promise I'll get into, I have to touch on some of the pre-existing oddities. There were three occasions where my husband had called out to me, aggressively. The first time it was something like, Danny, are you serious? And the second time he yelled, Are you even listening? We were newly married, but I'd been with him for years, and we'd lived in other places together for years. Not once had he ever so much as raised his voice. Alter his tone, sure, but not yell or feel the need to be abrasive with me. So those first two times, I'd responded hastily, and each time he was genuinely confused, walking into the room that I'm now yelling from, asking me calmly who I'm talking to. It actually was the basis of a small argument between us. It wasn't exactly resolved, but I forgot about it since it didn't happen again, until it did. I didn't think that my husband was home at the time, but he was working two different jobs and his schedule wasn't exactly pinned down. So when I heard the sound of drawers being slammed, followed by, Hello? Are you coming or what? I stomped down the stairs, ready to confront him, saying as I did, Excuse me? What in the hell are you yelling about? I was going to finish with, Are we going somewhere I didn't know about? But when I reached the bottom of the stairs, it was quiet. No one was there. I sort of fast-walked from room to room, saying my husband's name. No response. I moved to the front window. No car in the driveway. He truly wasn't home. I ran upstairs to grab my phone and I called him. No answer. I ran back down the stairs and I looked through the calendar that we had in the kitchen. According to that, he was working. I was totally freaked out. I decided to turn on the TV and open some windows. I don't know why I felt like it would help, but for some reason it did. About an hour later, my husband called me, and I explained to him what had happened while he was driving home. We were still on the phone by the time he pulled into the driveway. However, I heard a truck pull in before he said he was pulling into the driveway. As I went to the window, I saw nothing. Less than a minute later, I watched him pull in, hearing the exact sound I'd heard moments before. For a while, that was the last time I heard my husband's voice like that. I figured that either I got good at tuning it out, or it just sort of corrected itself. I was totally happy for getting most of this. We would talk about it from time to time when discussing weird things but we chalked it up to a weird glitch in the matrix. Sounds extreme, but when you truly have no explanation, it almost becomes the most logical. Then, we became parents, and basically life took over. If there was some sort of glitch or high strangeness going on, we were far too busy to be indulged. Fast forward a few years. Our daughter is four years old, is in the stage where she can get in and out of her bed, often finding her way into our bed. We keep a gate in the hallway and at the top of the stairs as to prevent her from falling down. I remember it was 2007 because it was the first time I'd had the flu. I was incredibly sick and essentially took over the family bonus room downstairs. I couldn't get comfortable in our bed, so my husband set me up in there with an air mattress, futon, pillow sort of thing. 
It worked, and I found myself in those feverish types ins and outs for several days. On this last day, though, I was finally feeling better. It was about 7 p.m., but I'd woken up, and I'd had more energy than I'd had in days. I was hungry, and I ate. All that good stuff. Because I was so awake, I found I couldn't or didn't want to go to sleep at a normal time. I decided I'd stay in the pillow fort one more night, allowing my husband and daughter to sleep while I fidgeted downstairs and hoped to eventually zone out on something until falling asleep. Around 8.30 or 9, my husband goes to put our daughter down in her room. I could faintly hear my husband telling our daughter a story. It was sweet, but I hadn't expected it since she was practically asleep in his arms on the way up, and I thought he'd come down already. I was leaning forward, trying to listen carefully, because again, it was sweet. Suddenly, my husband was in the doorway of the bonus room, and I actually physically moved backwards, terrified. He didn't look too great either. Did you just hear my voice? I just heard my voice. He started to walk closer to me and said, Do you think I have the flu now? I shook my head, insinuating no, and told him that I'd heard that too. Instead of saying anything, he sort of rushed up the stairs to our daughter's room. Within just a few moments, I saw him emerge and turn out the light. He'd come back down the stairs to report that our daughter was sleeping. Nothing was out of the ordinary. And just like that, he was able to move on. He told me that he did think he needed some extra sleep. And he kissed me goodnight before heading upstairs. I saw him peek in our daughter's room, just making sure, I guess. And then he said goodnight down the stairs to me. I could see him atop the stairs, so I blew him a kiss as he went to our bedroom. As I said, I was pretty awake. By this time, it wasn't much later than nine. I remember watching TV, specifically season one reruns of Top Chef. I sat there for quite a while. I remember thinking I needed to get up and stretch. It was about 10.30, and I was not asleep. In fact, I was starving, even after having a small dinner. So I got up and prepared some snacks, grabbed another Gatorade, and as I made my way back to the bonus room, I hear my daughter giggling from her bedroom. It was instantly creepy to me. I'd gotten this feeling that it wasn't her, but it truly sounded like her. It was her real and true giggle. But as her mother, it's like I couldn't buy it. I wasn't sold. I set my snacks down and headed up the stairs. The skeptical part of me is feeling uneasy. The practical side just wants to make sure that she's in bed. Once I hit the top of the stairs, I hear two voices, and it sounds as if my husband is once again reading a story to our little girl, and that she's giggling. The lights are off. I enter the room and quickly flip on the light, but there's nothing. No little girl, no husband. I quickly make my way to our bedroom, where I see them both snuggled and asleep in bed. Upon finding them both there, I was expecting to feel relief, but I'd just heard all of that. I was awake, still awake. I walked back to my daughter's room and I closed the door. I had, and still to this day, have no idea what happened. I've read about a gazillion things on the subject of mimics, doppelgangers, demons, time slips, you name it. But it all leads to the same answer, which is essentially that there is no answer. It could be any of those things, or none of them. I don't have mental health issues, not in my family or personally. And I have one validating moment of my husband hearing it too. Plus, I just feel like it's connected to that house. Before living there, I'd label myself as a fan of scary things, but absolutely not a believer of anything paranormal or supernatural. 
I'd never had any sort of experiences before moving into that house, and I'd never had anything like that happen since moving out, which was over seven years ago. I was scared for over a year after that happened, and that's what led to so much research. I just wanted to be able to explain it, and when I couldn't, it felt like pushing to move was the only decision. The original owner of the house really wanted us to stay, saying we were his best tenants, and he'd love to give us a discount on rent, etc. And for some reason, that made me even more wary of the space. So I don't know. These were the strangest, creepiest experiences of my life, and I feel the need to share them. Like, I know I'm not crazy, so that helps. But all that means is, I experienced something that I don't have the ability to truly explain, because no one can really explain it to me. And that makes my brain hurt on most days. I'll never have an explanation for what we stumbled upon, but it was pure evil. Whether this abandoned house that my friends and I found in the woods over a decade ago was truly haunted, or just a place for some sort of satanic rituals, I don't think I'll ever know. Regardless, it's so weird and disturbing that it needs to be shared. Maybe, for whatever crazy reason, Someone has come across something similar before as well. This was in Chester, Virginia, on a pretty busy street across from a Walmart shopping center. There's a veterinary office. Behind this office are nothing but woods. Not that far off into the woods, though, was an abandoned house that a couple of friends had heard crazy rumors about. We were deep into the ghost hunting thing, around this time and had to go see this for ourselves we parked in the veterinary office parking lot and made our way into the woods not even after a full minute of walking did we see it a worn down house with a couple of broken down vehicles to the side of it no driveway no mailbox no type of yard we looked around our surroundings and we could still see the veterinary office. We could see the street and cars passing through the trees, and all we could think was, what in the fuck is this random house doing out here? We slowly made our way inside. When we walked through the front door, the first thing we saw was a purse hanging from the ceiling in front of the door. There were stairs to the right, and near those stairs on the ground was another purse and a child's pink jacket. It's been over a decade, and I remember this so vividly. The floor was completely warped, as if the house had flooded at some point. No graffiti anywhere. To the left was the room that I will never forget, and it drives me crazy to this day that I'll never find any answers. Every wall in this room was covered with Bible pages. Someone had legitimately ripped Bible pages, one by one, out of the Bible, and taped them over every part of the wall. The only wall that wasn't completely covered in Bible pages had a hand-painted image in the middle. It was an image of a dagger through a heart. I'd say about four feet tall and three feet wide. It was the weirdest, most unnerving thing I've ever seen. The vibes I got, not just in this house, but this specific room, were unspeakably negative. What the hell could have been going on there? We decided to take a peek upstairs. Nothing nearly as crazy as already described, but still weird. 
a fold-out chair facing forward in front of the side window. One twin-size mattress. That was it. You just knew something was not right here. We did take pictures, and I wish I knew whatever happened to them. I drove by this area today, and it made me want to share this story. Those woods have been cleared now, and the house no longer exists. I can't believe there's never been any mention of this place since or before then. In our pictures, we saw tons of orbs. We took a picture of the side, upstairs window, from outside, and there was a very distinct red orb hovering over the window. Could have just been dust. Who knows? I saw enough crazy shit in there to know whether it was haunted or not. There are some twisted people out there, and I think some innocent people were involved. I hope you enjoyed this very true story, and if you happen to know of anything similar, please share. I would love to one day find clarity on what it was we all stumbled on that day. I'm not quite sure how to start a story that's plagued my family for three generations. So forgive me if I seem to bounce all over the place. My part of the story begins when I'm four or five years old. I'm taken care of by my grandparents, and they live in a cute, modest home in California. This home has a beautiful pool. This pool becomes my sanctuary. To this day, I'm still drawn to water. This pool is where my abilities started. I remember a man who would always visit me when I was swimming. The first time I saw him, I was roughly four or five. I was swimming underwater, and I saw legs and feet dangling in the pool, like someone was sitting at the edge with their feet in the water. For some reason, this person still had their shoes on, shiny black shoes, the kind people wear when they're getting really dressed up. I don't remember talking with him that day, but I saw those shoes often. Even at a young age, I knew that what I was seeing wasn't normal, and that sharing my experiences with family or friends might not be the best idea. I mean, no one else seemed to see him, only me. This man continued to visit me at the poolside for years, I grew to know him as my great-grandfather. He never spoke to me. His mouth never moved. But somehow, information was downloaded from him to me. And that's how I knew he was my great-grandfather. He was a tall, slender man. He always wore the same dark navy blue suit and those shiny black shoes. He had a bit of a receding hairline at the forehead and very white hair. He didn't really have any distinguishable features, except his eyes. His eyes were the most intense blue that I had ever seen, still to this day. When I was 13, my grandparents decided to sell their house and move into a retirement community. While packing things for the move, we run across an old photo album. You know the kind. Black background cute little corners that go over every picture to hold them in place. Really, really old. My grandmother opened the photo album and started to point at random black and white pictures and tell me who they were. She got to a short, heavy-set man with darker hair. She pointed to him and said, That is your great-grandfather. I thought, um, no it's not, but said nothing. I knew my grandmother was adopted, so I didn't think much about it. Only that my great-grandfather was a tall, slender man with the most intense blue eyes I'd ever seen. I'm not quite sure how old I was when the whole story about my grandmother's adoption really came out, probably in bits and pieces over the years. My grandmother never had any real family, 
so it always made her kind of bitter and jealous of anyone who did. My grandmother always told the story that she was an infant when she was stolen from an orphanage in Oregon. The people that took her weren't very kind. She often lived on the side of the road in a tent. They were always moving, almost as if they were running from something. She was never a whole person because of the things that she went through as a child. Years go by, and this man continues to visit me. Sometimes I can see him. Sometimes I just know that he's there. He never really says much anymore. Just seems to be here, somewhere, lurking. I start to feel uneasy about him. I'm getting older, and now I have enough knowledge about the spirit world that I believe he wants something. I mean... Why is he just always here? Why does even the thought of him send chills so deep inside that my hair stands up all over? Why do I feel scared to turn around to see if something really is behind me? One day while going through more pictures with my grandmother, something interesting happens. One of those moments in life where everything lines up in one split second. My grandmother is flipping through a stack of framed pictures, and she stops on this hand-colored photograph. It's a plump little old lady, and standing next to her is a slender tall man in a suit with the most intense blue eyes I'd ever seen. My breath catches in my chest. She points to him and says, That's your great-grandfather, the man who stole me from the orphanage. His name is Art. He's been dead for years. I'm in total disbelief, but still unwilling to explain. Fast forward to when I was around 18. My grandfather died. He was my best friend. It changed me forever. It changed my grandmother, too. She became so much more angry, so much more bitter, and so much more judgmental. The once beautiful social butterfly reduced to nothing after losing her husband. She moved to the middle of nowhere and rarely left the house. Dementia started and she became even harder to deal with. Over the years, I had asked to look at my grandmother's birth certificate to try to piece all of the puzzle pieces together. She always acted like I was pulling teeth and like it was insane for me to be interested at all. She was stolen from an orphanage, so there were no adoption records, only a birth certificate that didn't match the name that she ended up with. Her birthdays didn't even match. It was like she was created out of thin air. It always intrigued me. I'm the kind of person who believes it's hard to go anywhere in life when you don't know where you came from. At this point... I'm around 24, have a child of my own, and I would really like to be able to pass down some sort of knowledge about our family to my son, if he asks. During a visit up to my grandmother's house, her story comes up in a conversation again, only this time she acts like it's absolutely no problem to see her birth certificate, and she's shocked that she never let any of us see it. Good old dementia. She goes to the back bedroom and comes out with the oldest birth certificate I've ever seen. It was literally brown from age, and you could barely read anything on it. You could make out her birth mother's name, but of course, her father's name was completely illegible. I asked her if I could take it home with me. Now that the internet existed, maybe I could dig something up. Something to make any of this make sense. Not because it mattered to her, but because it mattered to me. I had already been doing some ancestry work on our family. I'd traced my grandfather's lineage back to when we came across from Portugal. I thought maybe if I used the same site I could find something, anything. I searched and searched with no luck. You just couldn't see enough on the birth certificate. I stuck the birth certificate away and I didn't think about it for a while. When I was 30, my grandmother passed away, 
after a very long, ugly battle with dementia and Alzheimer's. Some of the things she said in her last days will stick with me forever. They validated my spiritual beliefs and solidified a foundation to a world that most refused to see. When she was gone, I decided to contact Vital Records in Oregon. I pulled out the old illegible birth certificate, picked up the phone and explained everything. Leaving out the man with the intense blue eyes, of course. Amazingly enough, it works, and I'm sent a new updated birth certificate for my grandmother. I decided to contact a friend who'd helped me with previous ancestry diggings. Eric could find anything, and he did. He found my grandmother's biological family on both sides. Neither were very interested in knowing about her. Most of them denied her existence. Apparently, her birth mother had gotten pregnant at a very young age by a man only in town from Canada visiting family for a few months. I don't think he ever even knew my grandmother existed. Her birth mother was sent away to St. Agnes Baby Home in Oregon City, Oregon, to have the baby and to come home and pretend like it never happened. This was a common occurrence at the time for young unwed mothers. Because of this, my grandmother's biological family denies her existence. That night, I had a dream. I was in front of St. Agnes, and all of the babies were parked on the lawn in little buggies. And couples were walking by, admiring them. I woke up, and I didn't think much of it, considering what I'd been researching. Feeling like I was at a bit of a dead end, I decided to tell Eric the story of my grandmother, how she was stolen from St. Agnes by a man named Art B., and his then-wife, Sylvia. He told me to try to contact the orphanage, or the Catholic Church. There had to be recorded information somewhere. In the meantime, Eric went to work digging with nothing but a name. I call the church and find out that the orphanage is gone, the records burned in a fire, the building doesn't even exist anymore. The location is now smack dab in the middle of an intersection. Feeling defeated, and like the story had hit a brick wall, I asked the sister on the phone if babies were ever stolen from St. Agnes. Her reply still shocks me. She says, Well, they used to bring all of the babies out to the front lawn to get some sun and so that potential parents could see them. I would say at a time like that, it would have been easy to walk off with one. After a moment, I was able to muster up a thank you and hung up. A week or so went by, and Eric emailed me. He was almost giddy with information, explaining how interesting it was how he had used old census information and newspaper articles to track this guy down on Ancestry.com. He was blown away at what bad people Art and his wife seemed to be. He had stolen a man's identity. He was in fact a man named Isaac, who had seen a newspaper article about a man named Arthur B., who was maimed during World War II and confined to a hospital for the rest of his life. Isaac becomes a car dealer and uses many different people's identities through the years, obtaining the information at work. You have to remember, this was a day and age without computers. Stealing identity was as easy as saying that you were someone and having a social security number to back it up. Isaac stole Arthur B.'s identity and dies before the real maimed Arthur. Isaac is buried under Arthur's name in a Navy cemetery in San Diego, California. Because the real Arthur is confined to a hospital, he never has children. His other family dies before he does. No one ever catches Isaac. I don't even know what ended up happening to the real Arthur, if he was laid to rest under his real name, but I know Isaac is buried under the wrong name in a Navy cemetery without having ever been in the military. 
I'm now 34 and I have two sons and I'm married. My home holds many of my grandparents' belongings. One is a very large gold mirror. I was always drawn to it as a child. The mirror hangs in my dining room and it faces another mirror in the kitchen. Many believe that mirrors facing each other can cause spiritual activity, but I've tried to take one down and I feel completely out of balance, almost trapped. The kind of trapped that can cause an anxiety attack. I always have to put the mirror back up. At night though, that dining room makes me nervous. I always keep the light on just because. Isaac still visits. My last experience with him was actually quite frightening. He's different now. He's angry. His being has transformed to a silhouette. No features, no intense blue eyes, but I still know it's him. The last time he visited, I was laying on the couch, still very much awake. My eyes were closed and I was very relaxed. I felt a gust, like someone had run up to me very quickly from the dining room. Then, there he was. He was on top of me, holding my arms down at my sides. I couldn't scream or talk. It was so loud, everything was so loud. Like thousands of people in a waiting room, talking at once. They all seemed so anxious, like it was imperative that they be heard, and it was so loud, like nothing I've ever heard before. Then, he started screaming in my face. No words, just screaming. He was shaking me, and it scared me. I tried to calm myself down, and in my head, I asked him, What do you need from me? He shook me more and screamed again. He wouldn't stop screaming. I kept trying to communicate, but it was so loud. Everything was so loud. I couldn't move. I was so scared. I did the only thing that I could think to do. And I said, In Jesus' name, go away. Now, I'm not a very religious person. I consider myself an omnist. I believe religion was created by man and therefore couldn't not be flawed. I had seen this phrase work before and I was desperate. As soon as the last syllable left my mouth, everything stopped. I could move and it was peacefully quiet again. I was a nervous wreck and it probably took me 30 minutes to even sit up. I don't know what to do now, and I'm almost dreading the next time Isaac comes for a visit. I can tell he needs help, but I don't know how to help him. I don't know how to make it right, and I don't know why he's chosen me to be the person who needs to. I know this all sounds crazy. If it hadn't happened to me, I wouldn't believe it. Well, friends, we've reached the end of the darkest hour. Thank you so much to everyone who shared their stories and to everyone for listening. Speaking of thanking people for sharing their stories, be sure to check out the description below. Turns out, one of our true story authors tonight has a podcast of their own. It's called Lift Through It. It's not a spooky podcast, but rather up the alley of fitness. So, be sure to check it out. And remember, I upload new stories every Friday night, so if you like The Darkest Hour and you never want it to end be sure to hit that subscribe button. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, darkest hour at gmail.com. And check out our subreddit, 
The Darkest Hour, YT. Stay spooky.